few of you are starting to come in, uh, what I want to encourage you to do, because this is an interactive session, is open up the session materials. You can find them in the shared leadership folder. Under the professional development folder for day two, in there, you can open up the slides. They are a PDF, but the links are active. And so you'll need to click on those links, either by yourself or a couple of you at the table, in order to interact with the work that we're doing. So we're about 15 minutes delayed, so if you're just coming in now, you are perfectly on time. Again, or 10 minutes, excuse me. Um, go into, if you can, go into the MTSS leadership folder of materials, click on day two, find PD, professional development, slides and embedded materials, open up that PDF, and you can not only follow along, but you'll have some active activities. As people are coming in, we're gonna begin with the first slide. The first slide starts with an activator. There are four choices of activators for you, and all you need to do is click on the underlying stations link, and it will open up the four choices for your activator. Choice one, take 10 minutes to create a response to the following questions. What was your best professional development experience? What was your worst professional development experience? Another option, how can enhancing staff meetings affect student achievement and outcomes? Maybe you might want to do activator two, watch the video, and think about how can the Pygmalion effect affect teacher professional development and teacher outcomes. Maybe you'll want to play with activator number three. If you're universally designing your professional development, you're modeling that for your staff. And this is a draft UDL progression rubric for administrators around the topic of professional development. Where are you across that range? This activator then asks you, based on that, what are the implications to you of your own practice? Or activator number four, review the updated educator evaluation rubric language below and consider the implications to you as a practitioner in relationship to supporting professional learning. So I'm gonna give you two minutes to just look at the topics, then 10 minutes to engage in the activator. And for anybody that's really struggling to um, decide which one they want, you can roll the dice. I have a pair of dice, a die, and you can just roll it and say, oh, okay, I have, to do, I have to do number four then. So raise your hand if you wanna roll the die, otherwise, um, just give yourself two to three minutes to choose which activator and you can begin. Okay, I'm going to direct our attention back as a whole group. My hope was that and I'm going to do a, I'll do a countdown. We're going to come back in five, four, three, two, excellent. And so when we're thinking about why did I begin this session without direct instruction? Why did I begin this session with an independent activator? One of the reasons I did was to make sure we're all up on technology and give me the time to walk around the room and make sure that we're there so we can engage. Another thing was this concept of self-reflection and setting options for participants and making sure that I gave you an option for how you wanted to kind of begin this work. 
And then within that option, an opportunity to self-reflect. And some folks said, I chose, for example, they chose the draft administrator UDL progression rubric. And Kristen, we weren't even at the beginning stages of that particular rubric. And that's okay. And so when we think about what is our goal, it might be to just get on the board and think about how do we optimize individual choice and autonomy. And if we don't know, there's an example of what that might look like in practice to get us there. And if we're at that emerging, how do we kind of have a gradual release of responsibility as an administrator so that our staff have greater ownership over their own professional learning? And so I give you this draft rubric as only part of the activator that you can later continue to self-reflect on. And so I had said earlier, I am going to model the principles of universal design for learning in this presentation. And as we look at that logo that's everywhere in the conference, did you see that universal design for learning was on the outer casing of everything we do? And if that's the fact, as teacher leaders, building leaders, central office leaders, we should be modeling that in the work we do. And one of the cleanest and easiest ways as a leader is to do that by embedding that into our professional learning options and choices for our own staff. So they experience it and say, wow, that felt different. That felt great. And that is a great motivator for them. And so I want to take a quick step back if you don't have any background in UDL and just give you some very basic foundational principles. This is the 2008 Higher Education Act definition of universal design for learning, and I use it because I think it's the most crisp one that's out there. Universal design for learning is a scientifically valid framework for guiding educational practice. We offer flexibility in the way we present information. Flexibility in the way our students or our staff respond, demonstrate their knowledge and skills. Flexibility in the way we engage our participants. We're actively removing instructional barriers and creating opportunities for challenge for all and high expectations. <coughs> and I know that we say, yeah, of course, we would expect all of our teachers to have these expectations in their classroom. And then we get behind a closed door and we start talking about some of our colleagues that we support. And we may not utilize this mindset with them. Let me just wait a year till they're gone. I can't put kids in their room that have these needs because it just, it will not go well. And so when I think about this concept of mindset of how do we scaffold and support through mechanisms like professional learning, we have to have the same expectations that all is all, including our staff. And it is our responsibility to create scaffolds and supports for them through a variety of professional learning options such that they can all be successful. That is our role as leaders. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how we started to embed the framework of UDL into our professional learning committee when I was superintendent in the Groton Dunstable Regional School District. How did we really start to employ these, this framework in a tangible way? One is we created mechanisms for self-assessment and made sure that both the facilitators of our professional learning opportunities engaged in self-assessment and opportunities for feedback about what folks wanted to learn about and then gave them time in their sessions to self-reflect about if this is the expectation, where am I in relationship to that? You notice I gave you examples of rubric 
language. It created a, here's the standard, here's the expectation. Where am I in my readiness to meet that expectation? And as a result, some of you were asked to do things like, think about some goals you might want to set for yourself. So we're embedding these same things we expect in the classroom in our professional learning. And we made sure that they were collaborative because we want to foster collaboration and community. And we really thought about the barriers. So I want you to think about an initiative that you've implemented and what got in the way of that one or two teachers who sat like this during the workshop. What were their barriers? Sometimes I would have personal conversations with folks and pull them aside and say, I know this is coming. I'd love to hear from you, from the onset, what you anticipate being a barrier. So a simple example that many of us can relate to is technology. Consider whatever the initiative is, whatever the professional learning. Let's say something uh, that many of us have already moved to, some of us are thinking about moving to, which is uh, we're gonna have open up our grade book for families in the community, and they're going to be able to access their student outcome on a more consistent basis and not have it only at you know report card time or progress report time. And we're rolling this out in a professional learning option, and we've got this in the back of the room. And if we really unpack this, Part of it is, one, fear that parents gonna now call me every week when they see what's going on, I'm like, good, right? So we can create a collaboration, a com communication, and then when they do it, they realize it doesn't work quite like that, right? But it creates opportunities for dialogue when students are struggling, and two, I don't know how to use that technology. And so what we create as scaffolds for kids, sometimes we forget with adults. Well, just do it. Learn it, you should know this by now. And so what we want to think about is what kinds of bias do we bring about our expectations of our staff? How do we break that down and understand that these are barriers for them? And how do I, as the leader, remove those barriers in the design of the work? So I might put together a video screen video of how to use the technology. I might offer independent workshops before, during, or after the session. I might put the directions in writing in front of folks. I will give them opportunities for scaffold and support around a barrier. And less arms become crossed. And as you see the arms uncrossed, you still see a few, and so what you do is you go up to them and you dialogue with them just like you would expect them to do with the kids and say, what can I do to support you? and listen to that and redesign. Now, I would say for the teacher that has technology phobia, that video or that handout or that workshop, we say that's, for, that's designed for them. Do we believe that everyone should have access to that? Why not? That could help me on that day. And that's universal design. What works for a small group of people for access point also can be beneficial to the whole group. So we should make that available, not just to those few, but to the entire staff. Here's a video. If you're that person that gets anxious and you want to see it like a day or two before we present it, even if you feel like you have the technology tools, it will help you kind of understand that. We provide that support to all of our staff. We model universal design for learning. When we present professional development, we give them opportunities, for example, to activate their background knowledge, allow them to transfer new skills to their practice, allow them not to feel like they have to throw everything out and start new. How does it apply to the work they do, the things that work very meaningfully with them? We provide visual representations of the topic under study using things like multimedia. I gave options for the activator, some were video, some were written, right? So opportunity for both audio and visual. Some folks prefer to learn something on the onset in one way or another. We want to offer options for that. We want to provide options so teachers can choose the kinds and types of professional learning that resonate with them. Things like, yes, we're all going to do an opening day plenary about the importance of name the initiative, we're going to name it MTSS today, right? But what other options do we provide? Do we have guided book groups, right? Do we have mini workshops? Do we have graduate level courses? 
What kinds of options in our professional development repertoire do we offer within and outside of the PD calendar? Because I don't know about you, but I guess about 80% of you say you don't have enough time for professional learning, and I might be underestimating that. And so how do we create mechanisms? Now, if we truly engage our staff, they will participate in these options because they've asked for them, they're in ways they can do it in their, in their footy pajamas at night, right? We do online versions of book groups. You don't have to stay after. You've got a sick parent at home you're taking care of or a child you've got to get to a sporting event. We can't always create the kinds of experiences that touch all, but we can think about what options might resonate and see which work with which staff. And some folks say, I don't want to do it all online. I like to sit and talk, so we create an option for that as well. And how are they going to then implement the professional learning? So what kind of goals do they set for themselves as a result of their professional learning? Do we do things like pineapple charts to look at best practices or observe me to help with our challenges? What kinds of constructs do we have to have ongoing support of what we learn in professional development? We create things like exemplars and templates and rubrics, just like we would with kids, with our staff. Here's our expectation, here's what it looks like. And you know what, I want to engage and offer you opportunities for autonomy and ownership over your own learning. So here's a rubric of, this is what it looks like. I can understand the expectations of me better. And when we engage in professional learning, we have options for physical action interaction, response, not just sit and get. <clears throat> so what I'd like you to do right now, without looking up anything, I just want you to formulate and think and as a table come up with a response to this. Want you to write a definition of engagement right now. Write a definition of engagement as a table without looking up anything. What does engagement mean to you as a table? And put it into one sentence and I'm gonna walk around. to wrap up your guttural, off the top of your head definition. One more minute.
Hearing conversation die down, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find another table. And I want you to read each other's, have one person from one group read each other's definition. I want you to hear the other table's definition. And these are not fully formed ideas, and there's no judgment here. This is just, we're just thinking, you know, like when we talk about engagement, what, what is on the top of our mind? So find one table, and I want you, so I, I'm going to have everybody get up and physically move and find someone else. Try to find a new friend that you've never seen before, a table that you don't know. make sure the other team shares and when you're done I'm gonna have one member represent the group so do the not it so that member is defined begin to transition back. I need one member from each group to come up and meet me at the front. One member from each group, come be my friend.
I know. We're such we're such students. We're like, do we have to bring our definition? Does that does that have to happen? One member from each group. Here's what I want the folks behind me to do. I want you to reflect on this question and rate the answer. Over here on this side of the room is a high level of agreement. So if you agree with the statement I'm about to say, you're going to live here. Can you guess what's going to happen at this side of the room? A low level of agreement is all the way over here. And you can determine where you live across that spectrum of agreement with this particular sentence, the statement. Our two groups had the exact same definition of engagement. Our two groups had the exact same definition of engagement. Fully disagree, fully agree. Tell me where you are in that spectrum. Okay, what do we notice about our friends? They are not all in the same place. Let's give them a round of applause. That was it. How was so easy with that? So easy. You should be volunteering more often, right? So here's the thing. If we as a group of leaders who are often in charge of administering professional learning and overseeing professional learning, if we do not have common understanding and agreement of engagement, how does that impact and affect our staff? So I'm going to give you, and some of you could see it ahead of time, which was okay. I'm going to give this a bit of a wraparound definition of engagement. In the bottom, we have rebellion. And I'm going to put this in the context of teachers in a faculty meeting or in a professional development session, not students. Your rebellious teacher is in the back of the room making snarky comments, disagreeing with everything you say, and when they're not doing that, they're grading papers. Yeah, those are your rebellious teachers. You've got retreatism. This is the group that comes in and you find them nodding off in the middle of your presentation, even though you're doing a song and a dance. Your ritually compliant teachers are just coming in so they don't get in trouble. They don't want to get talked to, right? So they're just going to come in, and whatever you do, they're going to participate, but like this. And then we've got our strategic compliance. These are the honors kids of our staff. They are so in it for you. They want to please you. Will you give them praise? Will you smile at them? This is why they are doing the work that they are doing so they can get your positive affirmation. They are strategically compliant. We might perceive that as engagement, but that's not authentic engagement. In order for authentic engagement to occur, you need equal parts attention and commitment. Strategically compliant folks are not necessarily committed to the work. They're attending to the work. So in order for us to truly engage our staff, they have to find value in relevancy in authenticity to the work that we do in our professional learning. And so we can use the construct and the framework of UDL and live in the portion of that that deals with multiple means of engagement and is lighting up the affective network of the brain as a way to get our staff to think through both attention and commitment. And so again, if we're expecting our teachers to worry about this, we too must worry about this. And when we conduct professional learning, or dare I say, 
trainings, which by definition are different things, how do we ensure that they understand the relevancy of that work to them? How can we make it meaningful and keep them motivated? So I share this a lot when I work with teachers. And how many of you have seen this cartoon before? So if you can't see it very well and you can't see it projected on your screen, I will describe it. It is a set of animals and it is a teacher who says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, climb that tree. And we understand the inherent problems with this visual. And yet, I would hazard a guess that all of us as leaders have said pretty much this same thing to our staff at some point or another. I'm gonna take a controversial topic and introduce that concept to you. Safety training in our schools. I want you to think about the emotional capacity and competency and willingness and foundation and ask yourselves, do you truly believe that all staff have the ability without supports and scaffolds to participate in a training like that? And if not, how must and might we support them? in that work. So what I want you to do is redesign the surface and purpose of education in about 30 seconds. I'm going to have you do it. What I want you to do is redesign the environment in this cartoon and shift the question. Because it's not that he cares necessarily that they climb the tree. He cares that they get on the limb of the tree. And so when we think about universally designing professional development, our expectations and standards remain rigorous. Our job is how do we design a system so that everyone can be successful? Please do not tell me you're gonna cut down that tree. And that's an answer I hear a lot. Turn to a partner and tell me what's wrong with us just cutting down the tree so they can all get to the limb. Katie alluded to this this morning. We often call it the soft bigotry of low expectations. And not only do some of our staff have that of our students, we sometimes have that of our staff. And we are not going to lower that limb. We're going to keep the limb up there. I'm going to give you, honestly, 35 seconds, that's it, to redesign the environment so that they can all meet the expectations to be on the limb to see. Go. Your time to fully reimagine education is over. Now I ask you, as a table, was any table unable to come up with an idea for how our staff could achieve our expectation in this framework? Raise your hand if you were not able to come up with an idea. Correct, because you're all amazing. We have the ability and the capacity to redesign our environments to support this work. We just often don't take the time to reflect on it and give us the time to design it in the onset. And so I want to hear a couple of shout outs of what you did. What brilliance did you come up with in 30 seconds? What was it? Give it to me. 
Teamwork. A ramp. Ladder. Moving the actual furniture that's there. Elevator. Elevator. I've heard uh, like a water pathway for the right. We we can come up with things. We can come up with things. And so it's just the catalyst to do that. So when you're thinking about your next professional development session and you have the objectives in front of you, the next thing I want you to do is think about this. What might be the barriers to 100% of the staff accessing this expectation and task? And I want you to design through those barriers. So I'm gonna do a quick shout out to my colleagues in GD and show you how the work in Groton Dunstable, show the GD, I don't know what that means. It's my old district, you should all know that because that's my lived experience, so you should understand it. So I want you to think about what did it look like when we started to really say, we're going to use the principles of UDL in the design as of, of our professional development. So the first thing is, and I don't even think you could see it on the screen, but you could probably see it on your screen is, if you knew the players in the room, and at this point, Katie Novak right here is probably like seven months pregnant um, with the little one, so you can't even see that. But um, if you knew the players, you would understand that there were a lot less of us administrators in the room than there were teachers and practitioners in the room. And as we're designing professional learning to meet the needs of our staff, I always wonder why we don't get them in the room from the onset. And so when we think about, we're not even in merging stations. Part of that is we don't have any level of shared ownership over this work. And when you don't share the ownership, the outcomes are going to be less. When we first went into Groton Dunstable, remember the Tell Mass survey? Remember that? So they asked staff about conditions in their school, and one of those was about professional development. This is like nauseating to say, when we first got there, there was an agreement spectrum, right, a Likert scale, and only 9% of the staff agreed that professional development was meaningful to them and supported their practice. 9%. Within a year of us saying, we need to do this collectively and collaboratively, and you're gonna help design our professional learning work, how we assess it, what we administer, you're gonna help us choose those topics, you're gonna to solicit feedback from everyone to do that, 98% agreement. One year. We did not have any more of a budget, right? All we did was share the ownership over it and they gave us such tremendous insights. And some of the foundational work we did was create a shared vision for what professional development should look like. And some people say, we just wanna do the calendar, we just wanna do the brochure. But if we don't understand what our vision is for successful PD and then break down each of those words, what does high quality mean? What does collaborative look like? What does engaging actually manifest itself into? then we might be driving in different directions and thinking we're following the same map. And so it's really important that you start with fostering collaboration and community, engaging your staff in the work. The next is we really took advantage of the concept of optimizing individual choice and autonomy and designed a catalog of professional <coughs> learning options that were embedded into our existing calendar and structures and outside of it. And so, simply, this is an example of our catalog. And you see here what we did was, instead of having everyone do the same professional development, we created what we call the multi-part series, which was a 10-hour packaged series over the course of the year. And the topics were generated from Smart goals from the educators, survey data from the educators, and data analysis of student outcomes. The result of those three things drove the topics that we put into the calendar. And we had different multi-part series at different levels. 
and we had some that crossed multiple levels. And then we asked our staff, who were amazing practitioners, to help facilitate those. And you can see here, these offerings were things like district-wide arts planning, inclusive practices, writing units of study, physical education collaboration, lot behaviors and communication for preschoolers, right? All of these examples. And what we said was, we're gonna then bring these examples back to the staff, and we're gonna ask every single staff member, do you find one that resonates with you? Who have we left out? And we added sessions based on those responses. I see nothing here as a nurse practitioner. I don't see anything here that really resonates with me. I would like to have a session that is really relevant to my work and practice. As a superintendent, I led some of these when I couldn't find facilitators. All of my district building-wide and district leaders led sessions too. Because one of the feedback we heard was, we do professional learning and then you as leaders get up and leave halfway through 10 minutes in. And so we want you to engage more with us in these topics. And I thought, what better way for me to engage than to help facilitate and show them that I earnestly was part of the planning and presentation of the work that they had expressed that was of interest to them. And then we gave stipends with our limited resources. We gave stipends to teachers to facilitate those. We didn't have any more money, we just reallocated some of our existing resources. We also did things like lots of book groups. These are examples. We did a 15 hour buckets of stuff. We did graduate courses embedded in our, in our day. We did a, a collaboration with Gordon College. So three credits was only $225. Uh, for tuition reimbursement that they could use. And look at these book groups. These are all books that they chose. We just said, tell us what books you want, and then we went out and bought them. So look at these are just some of the books that they chose that year. And we did book groups, and we created what we call book groups in a box, which is already the facilitation manual in there, six to 10 copies of the book, go for it. And at the end of the year, we had a book group celebration. Everyone shared all the insights that they took. Because we wanted to make it not a barrier for them. Say, I want to participate, but uh, I don't want to create a facilitation manual. I personally taught a graduate course to our administrators and then opened up that course to other leaders and used the money to buy the books. Because I didn't have a robust enough budget to afford the amount of books that they wanted. And I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying we have to then take responsibility for creating the resources and going and finding them for our staff if they say that's what they want. We cannot hold them accountable in educator evaluation for meeting the needs of all learners if we do not create the capacity to do so. And so that means the competency driver is very important in the MTSS blueprint. And that comes in the form of professional learning, it comes in the form of induction, it comes in the form of hiring and asking the right questions during that process. It comes in the form of coaching. The other thing that we tried to model really robustly was to accept feedback, honor that, and give it right back to them. And say, this is what you told me is working, and this is what you told me is not, and this is what we as a committee have decided to do about it. Because if we don't solicit feedback, how can we feel like we're harbingers of feedback? We have to model that expectation. So I had some staff who said to me, I don't trust your online uh, survey. You ever have that? I don't trust your online survey. You're gonna know who I am even though we say we're not collecting emails. So I knew that was a barrier and I just created paper copies and made them available in the teacher's room and put a box so we wouldn't be in there when they gave it to us. And I used to say when I was a principal, I know your handwriting better. So I just want you to know that I literally can probably tell who you are better from the handwritten, but if that makes you comfortable, do it. Because why, why not? Why not remove that barrier for folks? So, um, I'm gonna stop for a second, and then we're gonna move into an activity. 
But I'm gonna stop for a second and just let you know that if you're looking for supports around MTSS, I've decided to create a monthly newsletter that I'm gonna send out, and it's gonna talk about all of the different drivers and resources. So if this is of interest to you, this is a free sign-up link and click. And one of the things we're gonna be talking about is professional learning and professional development options as different topics. And so again, I just wanna let you know that that newsletter is gonna start. Take a quick pause, a two minute pause, and talk to your partner. Did anything that we just kind of explored today, what are you thinking about it? Do you have pushback about it? Do you think there might be some strategies you can play with back on site? Just react to what we just went over, over the past uh, 45 to an hour. Another thing is I always overplan. I did it in the classroom as well. So I've overplanned, and there's gonna be some slides that we don't get to. So I'm gonna skip over a couple of slides because I wanna give you access and exposure to some tangible resources. But then if we have time, I'm gonna come back because one of them is a game. It's a scavenger hunt, and there's prizes. Yeah, so I kinda wanna get to that too. Yeah, so let's go over these resources really quick. I want you to know and reiterate that there are a set of academies these are three-year cohorts of support, wraparound love of academies. Districts can apply for them every year. We have new people come in. These are the different academies. We have the Inclusive Instruction UDL Academy. I happen to co-lead that. We have the PBS, PBIS Academy. Adam is here. He's not in this session, I don't believe, but he's the facilitator of that. We have the Systemic Student Support Academy. We have an SEL Mental Health Academy. Tiered Literacy is another academy that I um, co-design, and Tier Math. And so if these are areas of interest, look out for them in the spring. They fill up really quickly. But here's kind of what the support looks like. Most of these you need to qualify for participation because they're DESE sponsored. They're at no cost to the districts. And so generally that has a relationship to performance. And so if you're in a certain performance category, you get access, primary access. But there is always some that, uh, there's openings, they open up to others, so it can't hurt. I made my application maybe 30 seconds long, because I didn't want that to be a barrier for folks. Um, and so here's an example of the Tiered Literacy Academy, what you get out of it. We do three face-to-face -face trainings with people like Cornelius Minor. What? Yeah. How amazing is that? He comes to us three times a year, a northern and a southern region. We host two planning days where we support planning for tiered systems. What does it look like for resources and professional learning? And, and we're in the exploration phase and we're in the planning phase and we're in the initial implementation phase and we support you through that. We have a series of virtual modules that we give to the districts. By the way, I'm giving them to all of you today. What? You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and so we're going to give you these virtual modules, and these are one-hour little nuggets 
that you can bring back to your teams and do in a faculty meeting or do in a department meeting or chunk them all for a PD day, a half PD day, however you'd like to use them. They include the videos and a facilitation guide. In the tiered literacy, eight on-site technical assistance visits happen per district. Unless you have more than four schools, <coughs> I have some districts that have 32 days for in there, on-site, offering technical assistance. We also offer a graduate course. It's the train the trainer model. So somebody goes to the course so that they can come back and teach the course back on site. Instruction, inclusive instruction like the UDL, we do three UDL 101 sessions for first year cohort members. Three theme days, we bring in people like Wendy Morosky who's talking about UDL and co-teaching and supporting students with disabilities. Each year we have a theme. We have the regional planning sessions, 30 virtual modules that you're gonna get 20 of them today. This year's 10 haven't been designed, but you have my contact info for later when they get designed. Each session gets three TA sessions. They also get an online train the trainer book group, 15 hours of packaged book group, um, uh, that book groups that could go back and meet the needs of supporting students with diverse learning needs and supporting our L's. Sound familiar? Those are recertification requirements, right? So we're trying, trying to create systems in our academy that can be brought back. And you also have a graduate course, a hybrid graduate course. One member of the team goes, learns how to do it, brings it back on site. Some of you said, Kristen, we need more support than that. And this year we opened up a new intensive academy option. This is at a cost to member districts and they've used things like their turnaround grants or their Title IIA to fund this, and we'll go in for them uh, 13 days or 23 days on site per team to offer the level of technical assistance and coaching that they say they need. I will tell you that there are two academies that offer private entry, so if you are a district and you don't qualify for free, you can purchase at a discounted price participation. It is the UDL one and the PBIS one. These are active links, you guys. So this one takes you to the first set of UDL modules, one hour modules. This one is about self-regulation. Dr. George Van Horn led this one. These are not just Massachusetts educators, these are the Educators who are experts in the country and in the world are in these virtual modules. You get to bring them to your site for freezies. If you um, are looking for other options, these are also free. DESE has a 15-hour inclusive practice course for both administrators and teachers. That's an active link. You can get to the website for that. My dear friend, Louie Lord Nelson, who was last year's keynote, she wrote Culturally Responsive Design using UDL. She has a 15-minute podcast that is by teachers for teachers, 15-minute snippets of practices of UDL across the country. You want to just play? Play with those podcasts. We designed a set of nine series modules that were a result of a webinar series we did last year for turnaround schools and districts. And we turned them into modules. This is systems level. This is not something necessarily that your teachers would want to access, but your planning team may like it. How do we think about deconstructing inequitable systems? And it looks at different cohorts of students that we need to support. So this is an active link. You can click right in, and you can hear the work that we do around planning. Topics such as culturally responsive design and implicit bias, funds of knowledge, learner variability in special education, deconstructing inequitable systems to support all learners. And so if you're looking from a systems view for professional learning for your own staff, thinking about that bottom part of our circle, UDL on one top, bottom equity and access, these will get you there. And if you're really interested in pursuing this concept of equity, continue your learning, we have that October 24th conference, the equity conference of the Department of Education is sponsoring.
We also have some content modules, which I gave you for freezies again. I don't know why I'm so generous. I'm just feeling it, because I love you. And these are two or four modules where Cornelius talks about how do we think about this work in relationship to literacy, but really more about our systems. It's a systems level literacy module. So not necessarily something that teachers are going to go in and say, oh, I can apply these strategies, but something about our literacy leaders might really love and dig into. The Department of Ed on their website has something called the Instructional Level Book Study for Middle Grades Math. It's a virtual book study. Go for it. It's free and it's available to you. It's on the CIS website. I also linked to it here. It's first come, first serve, so sign up soon. And I'm just looking at the time, and we have about 10 more minutes, so we're gonna do the scavenger hunt. But I wanna, it, we have 10 minutes because we moved everything down 10 minutes, so lunch is starting at 12.30. I'm not keeping you from lunch. Don't start that rumor, I'll get in trouble. So um, what I want you to know is I put this resource together because when we support it, we have over 100 teams I support, we support in our two academies. Over 100 teams, just like you, teams of six to eight folks at the district and school level. And they were generous in sharing their challenges associated with professional development. So I put this resource together, and it's about breaking down barriers. Guess what the very first barrier is? Time. So there are five barriers that have been identified by your colleagues, and for each barrier, there's a set of resources and strategies and protocols for you to reduce those barriers. And now I'm going into our scavenger hunt. I spent a lot of money at Oriental Trading. Yeah, we know that's not true. Um, and so I have enough prizes. What prizes? If you're competitive, it's about winning, not about the prize. The prize is probably gonna fall apart in within two to three days, but it is a keychain with a globe on it. And so here's how you win the prize. You're gonna go up to the slide that says scavenger hunt, and only one team is gonna win this prize. So upsetting for most of you. And what you're going to do is you're gonna read, now this is a real agenda. This is a agenda from a few years back. Remember I showed you a video of George Van Horn? Well, he owed Katie a favor, so we came to GD. Remember, GD is Grot and Dunstable, for those of you that don't live in my context. He came to GD and he did a professional development session with our teachers and our leaders, and this was a leadership agenda, and it dealt with thinking through the connections of PBIS and UDL because we were more grounded in UDL and we were just moving into behavioral and integrated systems of meeting behavioral needs. And so this is an agenda he put together and I didn't ask him to universally design it, he just has a background in UDL and so he did. So I wanna share this with you, so I ask you to be explicit in your agendas of modeling the principles of UDL if that's of interest to you. You're going to click on that agenda. I have both a visual and an auditory version of the agenda. One of you at your table is going to click on the agenda, or everyone's going to click on the agenda. One of you is going to click on the scavenger hunt link. It's going to take you to a Google form. Write your team members' names. And where it says offering ways of clarifying vocabulary, you're going to put the time, the time that it happens on the agenda. Okay? So just the time that these things happen on the agenda. Here's Here's what I have to tell my leaders, because I do this with leaders all the time. Do not overthink this, okay? Because then you get, you'll spiral into like 20 minute conversations. It's, it's not as hard as you're making it. It should be fairly obvious. So just go in the agenda, find these indicators, fill out the survey, the team that gets all of them correct first wins the prize. Go.